Now, coming up with a model to describe the evolution of the entire universe was always going to be a little bit tricky. And to be honest, it's just incredible to me that we can even hope to do this, given how complex the universe is. But for a while, us astrophysicists thought we were onto a fairly good model. It matched a lot of what we observed in the universe. But in recent years, in the past decade or so, more and more observations have been made that don't really match that model. And cosmologists have started questioning it more and more. So how are we going to solve what's been dubbed the crisis in cosmology? So the job of a cosmologist is to try and understand the evolution of the entire universe, i.e. how it's changed as it's aged. We can do that because light takes time to travel to us. So when we look at the most distant objects, we actually see them as they were when the light left them billions of years ago. So you really can actually compare like for like how the universe looks now with what it looked like billions of years ago if you observe things further and further away. What you then want is a model or a theory, right, that best describes those changes going from what the universe looked like in the past to what it looks like now so that we can then understand, you know, how our universe started, how old is it, and what might happen in the future. So any model you come up with has to explain a couple of key observations we've made about the universe that are just irrefutable, right? The first one is that the universe is expanding and that it has very recently started accelerating expanding as well. Second one is that you have to explain the cosmic microwave background, this background signal of radiation that we see coming from every direction in the universe. It also needs to explain why galaxies look different now than they did tens of billions of years ago, and it needs to explain why galaxies group or cluster together, leaving these huge big voids in between. And the model we have to best describe that right now is called Lambda CDM. Lambda is a Greek letter and essentially means like the universe is expanding and then CDM, cold, dark matter. Essentially, this model says that the universe started in a very hot and dense state and it's been expanding outwards and cooling ever since. And it says that in the very early days of the universe when matter was incredibly hot and dense and it was what we call a plasma, the universe was actually opaque to light or radiation. But as the universe cooled and the matter cooled, the universe eventually became transparent to radiation and literally the first light was emitted. And that first light is what we detect in the cosmic microwave background, an echo of this expansion outwards that we call the Big Bang. All the multicolored bits on this image of the cosmic microwave background show you where the hottest and the coldest parts of the universe were at that time when that radiation was released. The first stars and galaxies were formed in the coldest spots that we see on that cosmic microwave background and were grouped together under gravity and as the universe expands, left behind voids between clusters and groups of galaxies. And Lambda CDM also says that to go from that hot, dense state we had at the beginning to the universe that we see now around us, you need 25% of the universe's entire energy budget to have gone into making dark matter. And you need another 5% to make all the normal matter that makes up stars and galaxies. Now, the other 70% of the universe's energy budget goes into causing that expansion of the universe. And we call the force that's doing that dark energy, but we have no idea what it actually is. All that we know is that if you upset that balance of the energy budget between dark energy or dark matter and, and normal matter, you can't fit to the early universe and recreate what we see in the universe now, and you can't fit to the universe that we see now and rewind to get back to what we had in the early universe. The model breaks otherwise. It only works when you have that nice balance. Now, one of the key things you can get from this model, this Lambda CDM model, is the expansion rate of the universe, i.e. how much bigger it's growing every second or every year or even every billion years. It's something we call the Hubble constant after the astronomer Edwin Hubble, and we write it as capital H naught. And so from fitting this Lambda CDM model to make sure that it, you know, gives us something that looks very similar to the early universe and something that looks very similar to our universe with its very specific energy budget, 
we can then get at a rate of expansion, this Hubble constant with a value of 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which of course then has some error estimate on it as well, plus or minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec that comes just, you know, from your uncertainty on your model and the data you're fitting to, in this case, obviously the cosmic microwave background. So then what you want to do is check if your model is giving you a good answer. What you want to do is compare the value of the rate of expansion you get from fitting your model to what we see in the early universe and now with a direct measurement of the expansion rate from observations. This was actually one of the first ways we got an estimate for what the Hubble constant was and unsurprisingly it was done by Edwin Hubble and he did it by looking at how fast galaxies at different distances were moving away from us. Now we can do this using something called redshift. Redshift is what happens to light when it travels from distant galaxies to us here on Earth through expanding space. The light actually gets stretched, its wavelength gets stretched out to a longer wavelength. Longer wavelengths are redder colours of light, hence redshift. And if you can measure how much the light has been redshifted, then you know how fast space is expanding. And you can do this with a galaxies at different distances. And what we find is that the more distant a galaxy is, the bigger the redshift and the more space has expanded. We can make a nice plot of this, of the redshift against the distance. And you can see that the points all nicely correlate and we can draw a line of best fit. And the slope of that line is the Hubble constant that you measure. This estimate of the rate that the universe is expanding at, how much bigger is it getting every second or year or million years? The problem with this method is that there's a lot of uncertainty involved in it. So it's a lot easier to measure distance to something that's close by than is further away. Your uncertainty on your measurement of distance gets bigger the greater the distance you're trying to measure. But redshift is much easier to measure further away than it is close by. For example, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the Milky Way's biggest nearest neighbor, actually has a blue shift, not a red shift. We say it has a negative red shift because it is actually moving towards us, not away from us. And that's because the gravity between the Milky Way and Andromeda is stronger than the force of dark energy pushing outwards. And so one day those two galaxies will actually collide together and merge in about two to three billion years or so. The same is true for galaxies in groups as well, right? They'll be orbiting the very center of that group, usually the heaviest galaxy in it. So they'll have what we call their local motion as well as their overall motion away from us due to the expansion of space. And it makes measuring their redshift just that little bit more difficult, especially when they're much closer to us than the things further away. Those local motions don't become as important the more distant you get. The expansion of space dominates their redshift. So there's lots of uncertainty that comes into this measurement, but we can reflect that in our estimated error, right? On the value that we quote, which comes out at 73.5 plus or minus about 1.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And what you'll notice is that it's completely different to the number that we had before that we got from our cosmological model, Lambda CDM. It ends up in a difference in the age of the universe of over a billion years years. This right here is the crisis in cosmology. That the value that we get from our best fit model of the universe that we can come up with doesn't match the value that we get when we go out and directly measure it. And that's true of any method that we can come up with to measure it in our sort of local universe. They all fall in that 74-ish kilometers per second per megaparsec camp. And any method we can come up with that uses the cosmic microwave background and stuff we observe in the early universe comes up with the 67-ish kilometers per second per megaparsec value. Now this problem raises two very big questions. The first of which is, is there something wrong with the data or the observations that we've taken? Is there some inaccuracy maybe that offsets all of our measurements by say 10 times what they should be? Or are we measuring the distances to very distant galaxies wrong? Or is there something wrong with the cosmic microwave background data when we observe that? If any one of those is true, then we're gonna learn way more new physics. So, or option two is that there's something wrong with our best fit 
model lambda CDM. Maybe there's some component of the universe that exists that we've never thought of before, that we've just completely missed from our model. Or maybe we've overestimated the importance of say dark matter or dark energy, perhaps. If any one of those is true, then once again, we're gonna learn way more new physics because of it. So either way, we're gonna learn more, which is a win in any scientist's book. But how do we figure out which one is the problem, the data or the model? If we start with the data, over the past decade, people have been reanalyzing the cosmic microwave background data and the distance to galaxies data in all of the new and creative ways that they can think of, all of these novel methods. They've also been coming up with new ways to measure the distance to galaxies as well that's completely independent of any way we've used in the past. You know, it's not reliant on any stepping stone to say, well, if this galaxy is this far away, then this one must be this far away, and then I can extrapolate from there. Completely independent of all of that. And despite all of those efforts over the past 10, maybe even 20 years, we still get this massive difference in the values for the Hubble constant that we get. So what if it's the model that's wrong then? And to be honest, in my head, this is what seems most likely, but I am an observational astrophysicist. I do astronomy with telescopes. And so to me, you know, you trust the data <laughs> more than you trust the model. And so again, over the past decade, people have been coming up with new models. They've been tweaking old models and seeing if anything else that they can come up with, whatever crazy easy idea they have for a new model can fit better than the one we had before. But still, nothing fits the evidence better than lambda CDM does and we end up with the same problem where the two values of the Hubble constant we have don't match. So we're still no closer to solving this problem. And it's not like we're all just gonna give up and go home or anything. There's people around the world that are you know, still trying to come up with new models to test against Lambda CDM and coming up with new ways of reanalyzing the data. So that's all still ongoing. But what we could really do with to solve this crisis in cosmology is a brand new way of measuring the Hubble constant that is independent of both, you know, the cosmic microwave background and the model fitting that's done for Lambda CDM, but also completely independent of the way that we've measured distance in the past, a whole new way of measuring distance that's nothing to do with stars or galaxies. And luckily we now have just that with gravitational waves. These are ripples in space-time itself caused by the movement of massive objects like black holes and neutron stars orbiting each other. And we detected these ripples for the first time back in 2015 using the LIGO detectors in the USA. And the great thing about gravitational waves is that the amplitude of the wave falls off as one over distance. It's inversely proportional to the distance it's traveled. And so if you measure the amplitude, you can get at the distance independently of any other way we've measured it before. Just what we need to measure the Hubble constant. But we can't measure the redshift of these gravitational waves. For that, we still need some light to be given off at the same time. And the annoying thing is obviously that black holes famously don't give off light, but neutron stars do. And back in 2017, we detected just that, the merger of two neutron stars that gave out both light and gravitational waves, which meant we got a redshift and a distance independent of any other method we've ever used before to measure the Hubble constant. Now, of course, with only one data point to go off, it doesn't exactly give us the most accurate measurement of the Hubble constant ever, but it's still something and it's a star. And they managed to calculate it as 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec with quite a huge whopping big error of on average 10 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that probably wins it the title of the most annoying science measurement ever because it put it smack bang in the middle of the other two estimates. So that didn't exactly give us what we wanted, did it? Because with such a large uncertainty of it, of either plus 12 kilometers a second up to 82 or minus eight down to 62, it's a huge range of values that that could be. One way to drill down that uncertainty though is to observe more of these neutron star, neutron star mergers, and then we can get more points on this graph so that we have a much better estimate of what the Hubble constant is. 
Now, a paper that came out last month in January 2021 by Feeney and collaborators tried to estimate how many of these neutron star neutron star mergers we should be able to detect with LIGO in the next five years or so. And they estimate that it should be around about 50. 50 would be great because then we could drill down the uncertainty to about a kilometer per second per megaparsec and be much surer of our value of the Hubble constant we measured. Then we can test, okay, well, does it agree with the value that we get from Lambda CDM, from fitting to everything we see in the universe? Or does it agree with the uh, value we've got from measuring the distances and the redshifts to nearby galaxies? Whichever one it doesn't agree with is the one that we'll then be able to tell was well, that has the issue with it and we need to work out that issue. Either we need to figure out what's gone wrong with our measurement of distances to galaxies or we need to figure out what's gone wrong in our model and we will need a new model. But that's going to be at least five years away, in fact, probably more, because LIGO stopped all their observations in March 2020 to keep employees safe during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Now, they were halfway through their third observing run when they shut down, and they planned to make a load of upgrades before the start of the fourth observing run, just so that they could make it more sensitive and probably be able to even detect more of these neutron star, neutron star mergers, which would be great. But that timeline is obviously all up in the air now. They have a preliminary start date of June 2022 to start that fourth observing run, but that's all dependent on whether they can actually get in and start making those upgrades safely. So it looks like we're all just going to have to be that little bit patient before we can solve the crisis in cosmology. But you know what can happen in five to ten years? You know, someone could spot a huge glaring error in the data that solves everything. Or someone could come up with some new and innovative model that does a well better job than Lambda CDM. Who knows? All I know is that it's a great time to be an astrophysicist or a cosmologist or even just a space enthusiast who loves hearing about this stuff. Because either way, whatever happens, we're all getting a front row seat as science history gets made. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a huge thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app built on the principle that you learn best by problem solving yourself and not by watching lectures like this one. <laughs> They have interactive courses on a huge range of science and maths topics, which will give you instant feedback so that you can learn quickly and effectively. But I thought you would all appreciate their course on cosmology, which takes you through the fundamental concepts that underpin pretty much everything I've just talked about in this video. So if that sounds like fun to you and you want to support me and my channel, head over to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y and sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link that is in the video description down below will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant. And now roll those bloopers. It needs to explain the echo of radiation left over from the Big Bang, which we call the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. CMBR, if you're in one division universe, apparently. <laughs> this right here is the crisis in cosmology. That the value... Stupid chair. We like to model Lambda CDM. We like to model Lambda CDM. So that raises two big, that's three. Where did you pop up from, finger? Stay down. <laughs> we are all essentially getting to watch science history get me. That is such a rude thing to do, Radiator. I was on my last big line and you ruined it. 